Hey, welcome back to another Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. How are you? What the hell is your problem? Write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. In fact, I'm going to read several emails today, and I'm going to start doing that with a little more regularity. Uh, J. Mac, our producer and uh, my research guy, I don't mean to throw him under the bus here, but I've been sort of relying on him to uh, supply me with emails. Well, not cracking the whip and not asking for him enough, maybe. I'll, I'll, I'll put myself under one of the tires of the bus. But uh, I've taken back the reins. I'm going to go through your emails on my own, and I'm going to reply to as many as I can, and I'm going to read as many as I can, damn it, because you are the reason I'm sitting here and talking. Um, my ego let go of this show a long time ago, folks. We're nine years old this month. Did you know that? Didn't get your gift. Uh, coming to you today from the Airwolf Studios, Sam, our engineer, uh, is, uh, one of the, and I'm just going to say it. He's the best. He's the best here at Airwolf. I've not said that before about any of the engineers. I'm going to go out on a limb and just, I'm going to be a Sam man. That's what's happening. Uh, speaking of Sam, Sam Levine and Jamie Foxx are both not here. They were not in, uh, invited. Write to us again, kpc at fanmail at gmail.com. Recent guests, you ask? All right. Again, love the questions. Christopher Guest, Lauren Graham, J.K. Simmons, and yes, you heard me, Ricky Gervais. Uh, excited to report I'm off to New York next week for the first table read of season two of the Golden Globe winning The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel on your Amazon Prime. Uh, so damn excited to return for season two. Um, you've probably heard me talk about this show a couple of times by now. Uh, if not, um, well, as our post producer, Corey Levin, put it, I love the show. It's like Mad Men, but this time about the Jews. Um, you, don't, <laughs> you don't have to like or not like Jews to enjoy this show. Uh, and also, Andy Richter said, very funny, I just started watching this marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I'm really enjoying it. But man, they make, make it look hard to be a Jew. Um, uh, from the creators of the Gilmore Girls, Amy Sherman Palladino and Dan Palladino, the writing is uh, some of the best writing I've been involved in in over 20 years. I, I've not yelled at my friends to watch anything I've been involved in in over 20 years, and I'm, I've yelled at all of them. Um, and I'm also hearing from people I've not heard from in forever, past guests of this show, just reaching out with an email, what have you. It's really, really been an exciting um, year, or at least since November 29th when the show dropped. Uh, uh, four nominations, uh, one all four. Um, yeah, just uh, fuck the nominations and the awards. What I really mean to say is it is great to be involved in something that um, our, our, our makeup artist, Jaden Fox, and her other 19-year-old friends are obsessing on as well as my 63-year-old poker pal who's in the schmata business his whole life is going bananas for my character in particular. Um, yeah, so uh, very excited to report we're back to work. Uh, first table read next week and uh, much more to report in the days ahead and weeks and months. Let's read some of your fan mail, damn it. Uh, beforehand, I'm going to bring in our guest uh, to help me with uh, some of this. Um, Every now and then on the show, it's important to me to do uh, what I like to call Stars of Tomorrow. Uh, our, our guest today is someone that uh, I've been watching uh, do uh, improv work at the West Side Comedy Theater and uh, have just uh, drafted him into a super group. Um, more about that to come later. Uh, a very exciting project that we're working on together. And so I just called him and said, hey, James Heaney, why don't you come on the show and let's have a conversation. Please welcome. And then what if I said a different name? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I am James Heaney, the real James Heaney. Right. Uh, I don't think I'd answer to another one. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Were you ever called Jim? Uh, when I was a little kid, I was called Jimmy by my by my whole family. And when I became an adult at like fourth grade, I was like, now I am James. And did you, in fact, announce that to the family? Well, yeah, pr I did. The only person that wouldn't, my grandfather to the day that he died, uh, would call me Jimmy. And he was the only one in the family that I pretty much, I mean, there was no t stopping that. Sure. Nor did you really want to. No. It's grandpa. No. But I do think that Jimmy sounds like a like a young child, and I felt like it was time to be a man. Yeah. And I, I James a, has served me well. I have a couple friends, Jimmy, Joey, and I do give them shit about it. At what age do you become Joe or Jim? 
Well, the earlier the better. I mean, grow up. <laughs> yeah. It's like just grow up. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to read the, the 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 some fan mail. We're going to comment on on them together. Okay, great. Hello, Moish. Again, Moish is the character I play in the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Hello, Moish. I have really come to love the podcast and look forward to new episodes. I love the repartee or rapport you have with Jamie and Sam and the fact that all the guests and are intelligent and it's an intelligent dialogue uh, remain – and that remains the primary focus. <laughs> I like to make up words while I'm reading other words. Uh, I want. I wanted to know if uh, did you mis misread the word reporte? <laughs> reporte. Well, it says rapport, and rapport. I wanted it to say. Reporte. So you did it on purpose. See, if it was me, I would have probably just gone straight on past it, wondering what reporte meant, uh, <laughs> and dealt with it. Yeah, no, it says rapport without a T, oh. and I said reporte. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> like I said, I like to make up words while I'm reading other words. Uh, the letter continues. Even when I doze off during the show, it is so refreshing to hear your soothing voice when I wake up. This is something that happens over time. If you're fortunate enough to do any kind of work that people will compliment. They'll they'll give you what's called a, an ass-backwards compliment mm -hmm. or a back-asswards compliment. Um, they a don't, criticism. They, what don't you're realize, <laughs> they don't realize at all that it's a criticism, that it might be taken by an insecure or super sensitive artist. Even when I doze off during the show. Now, I myself watch television till pretty late in the evening. Um, while in the uh, bedroom, I'm just going to say. Mm -hmm. In the bed. Okay. In Come the bed. On. In the mm -hmm. bed. I'm picturing it. Sure, sure. <laughs> I've got uh, – do you want to know what I'm wearing? <laughs> what are you wearing? <laughs> I'm wearing uh, uh, a silk pajamas top and bottom from the 1960s. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. And I've got one of those hats, a sleeper's hat. With a puffy ball at the P end? Puffy ball at the end. Very lightweight though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. None of that is true. Um, so I doze off watching shows that I love. Sure. So I mean maybe I don't need to be so sensitive no, when but, this guy says. Yeah. But the thing – I mean – I, wa I fall asleep watching television. It's a complete uh, show ruiner if somebody in an audience live is asleep. It's hard. <laughs> it's like the whole room could be having a great time, but one sleeping <laughs> audience member really draws my attention. Yeah. In a podcast, not the case. Yeah, not at all. Even your arms crossed, I'm not going to enjoy if it's a live show. Yeah. Um, while I am sure the letter continues, you have made efforts to have John Cleese on as a <gasps> guest in the past. I know that your audience would love to hear you talk with the great man. I shared the Dick Van Dyke episode with my 81-year-old mom, and she thought it was amazing. She said she could do without the potty talk. <laughs> but all in all, you made a fan there. Oh, man. I love the 81-year-old mom saying, well, I could do without the potty talk. I may be a late comer to the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, but is honestly much, all caps, better than I was expecting. Again, a little last bat, a little. Uh, uh, well, I mean, that's a straight up compliment. If you would have said it was, I was expecting so much from you and it was good, then that would be really the, uh, the ass backwards compliment. Okay. Um, an obviously deserving winner of the Golden Globe. How nice of you, sir. Uh, it must be a blast to perform with that cast. And then in parentheses, is it true what they say about Tony Shalhoub? I don't know what anyone has ever said about Tony Shalhoub. This is the first time I've been hearing there are things said about Tony Shalhoub that would belong in parentheses. But if you were going to make a guess, is it appropriate to make is a guess? Is it true what they say about Tony Shalhoub? Um, is there a sentence that follows that gives hints at what he was saying? No. Oh. It goes right back to uh, the topics at hand. Is it true what they – I'm going to bring that up to Tony. You know what? I'm going to give Tony a chance to, to answer that. That's a good that. answer. Yeah. Uh, I'll be recording some of these from New York. Uh, here's hoping I can, I can convince my co-star Tony Shalhoub to be on the show and then I will put that to him. I'm not even going to take a guess. Gander. So just – if I was to ask you – Sure. Uh, is it true what they say about you? What is? Does your gut instinct say that it's true or that it's not true? What they say about me? Yeah. Um, as opposed to trying to figure out what they might be saying. You yeah, just exactly. want to know if Like I if I was just saying, Kevin, is it true what they say about you? Are you going to say I yes would or say no? say probably. Probably? Yeah. Yeah. I would say no. Absolutely not. If you're asking me <laughs> if it's true what they say about me, I'd say no way. <laughs> Whatever they said, you should discount that. Well, to be completely honest, um, instead of just trying to be entertaining – is it true they say about you, Kevin? My first gut response would be, what did they say? <laughs> I mean, that's for sure. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you, then you would say, never mind. I, I just want to know if but it's true. But you'd pull them into private first. So yeah. It's not like something in public you'd hey, be hey, like. Hey, to... hey, hey, what are you, what are you fucking saying to me? <laughs> There's that potty talk. Uh, say, why don't you ever promote the show on your podcast? Three exclamation points. I'm assuming he's being facetious and making fun of me for promoting the show on the podcast too much. Big fan from the heartland or uh, Overland Park, Kansas, uh, Adrian Margolis. P.S. Do you see yourself doing a stand-up tour anytime in the future? Uh, James, do I? I thought you were just on a stand-up tour. I was, but it was in Canada, nowhere near Kansas. Oh, yeah. well, I mean, it's— yeah. Also just three shows. I never really toured. No. Um, uh, the longest tour, oddly, was in Kansas. It was uh, two weeks, like the 20th anniversary of the Just for Laughs, Just Puri, uh Montreal Festival. That was and just recent, right? Well, the, not the 20th. I think they're up to 35 or oh, by okay. now. So the 20th was a good 15, 16 years ago. But it was uh, – they probably do them every year now. But it <laughs> not, was not a 20th anniversary, <laughs> though. I assume they keep right. going up. It was a 14-city theater, uh, <laughs> coast to coast, all of Canada over two weeks with me and five other comedians, um, at least, some great ones, all Canadians. And it was the first time I realized that I'd done an extended tour, but also the first time that I'd toured with a group of comedians mm -hmm. where there was a band of brothers element to it. You've done tours as an improv group. Oh, yeah. I've spent a lot of time on the road. Yeah. But so I, I don't know if it's the same thing because like – Oh, it isn't because a stand-up, I'm always touring alone. Mm -hmm. And and um, I sometimes tr think, oh, so this is what it feels like to be a serial killer. Where you're just in your own thoughts for for the weekend. There's no one there. You go out on stage, right? You're coddled. Um, uh, the the hour you're on stage is magical, and then you you have this incredibly private existence for 72 hours. Where I mean, I, I, I could be just a traveling salesman. I don't know why my brain went to serial killer, but <laughs> but the idea that. Um, well, let me just ask you this. Do serial killers also worry about carbs? Okay. Let's go on to the next letter, shall we? Hello, Kevin. Oh, do we answer all of Adrian's questions? Uh, uh, I'd like to have uh, John Cleese on. I love when they suggest people, but they have no way of getting to the person and help me book them. That would be good. Uh, he's on Twitter. He's on Twitter. And also, I just saw that he's coming to Los Angeles in March and performing some sort of show. Really? At the Saban Theater on Wilshire. Um, so, uh, Corey in post, remind me, damn it. You know what, Kevin? Just write it down. You know, the bar little Corey with this. Uh, I'm going to reach out and try to book John Cleese because I do want to go see the show. Okay. Um, were there any other questions? Potty mouth, uh, a couple of backhanded compliments. That was the expression I was looking for. Okay, here we go. Hello, Kevin. On to the next letter. This one comes to us from um, Vince Early. Never late. Mm -mm. CSEP, Thomas Caterers of Distinction. Hmm. That's a lot of... Uh, Is that a company that he works for? I'm going to hope. Uh, next to his name in all caps, CSEP. What, no. could, what could that possibly stand for? Uh, Vince Early, write to us again. Uh, KPCS fan... What was it? Yep. KPCSFanMail at gmail.com. Let us know what CSEP or any of you who know. Vince writes, hello, Kevin. I know this has been a long time since you did this. I know this has did been what? a long time since you've done this. But I have been attempting to find your recreation of Lenny Bruce at Carnegie Hall on all sorts of media outlets and can't seem to find it. If you have covered this, then I will go fuck myself. It's a mm, real fan of the wow. show. Yeah. But if you have any advice on where I can find this piece that you did, I would be forever grateful. Um, well, Vince, uh, it's true. I was part of the 125th anniversary, I want to say, of Carnegie Hall. It was uh, a historical night for me in many, many ways. Uh, I think I spoke about this on the show, also, um, I talk about meeting uh, former President Clinton in in my stand-up and in my book. All also happened that night, and also the way Steve Martin sort of looked after me because uh, it was his idea that I do Lenny 
uh, a tri- it was a tribute night. So Steve Martin did the, who's the banjo playing Scuggs? Oh, I don't know. When yeah. I think banjo player, the first person I think of is Steve Martin. Earl. Earl Scuggs. Thank you, Sam. Again, the best. <laughs> um, so Steve Martin did a, a tribute to Earl Scuggs. Um, Bette Miller did a tribute to Sophie Tucker. Sting did a tribute to the Beatles. Um, James Taylor performed, and he was the host. Uh, and then James Taylor and Steve Martin decided that they wanted to do a tribute to Lenny Bruce. And Steve Martin, who I'd worked with a couple times, suggested me. And because he said, I know this guy that does impersonations. Maybe he can do it. And I heard from – I can't remember if it was – I think it was James Taylor I heard from first. And then he said, well, I've talked to Steve and he's going to call you and and you guys can figure out which Lenny Bruce routine to do. And uh, Steve was just magical and, and incredible in sort of protecting me and the piece. You know, he said, well, do one of the early bits, not the controversial ones because it's going to be an older crowd and – you know, Lenny had a very famous uh, midnight show at Carnegie Hall. It was actually two or three weeks, I think only two, after the Kennedy assassination. Mm. I'm going to keep digressing. We're never going to get to the <clears throat> letter, back to the letter. But this is kind of amazing. So there was a world-renowned impression, impressionist who did uh, Kennedy and there was a – number one best-selling comedy album called The First Family where they did the Kennedys. And this was – you know, Kennedy was, Kennedy was only president, what, two years before the assassination? Maybe not even. So – well, November. So it was probably two. Um, and this album, within a year of him being in the White House, they did this First Family thing where they made fun of the Kennedys and, and for all the various reasons – and it became the number one selling album, not just comedy album, number one selling album. It was insane, really? insane hit. Was was it common that comedy albums would be compi- – like at that day and age? Well, they had – comedy albums, that I think, th- through the late 50s sort of became a thing, yeah. And uh, Von Meter was the name of the guy who did John F. Kennedy. And he was so famous for doing John F. Kennedy that he he would be booked in in – on, on Ed Sullivan, all these great TV shows just coming out and doing Kennedy. And and I don't know. They, I just remember the guy was so absurdly famous for doing Kennedy in a heartbeat, right? Rose to the top of show business for doing this ridiculously amazing. So two weeks after the assassination, Lenny Bruce has this very famous midnight show. And there was a huge snow blizzard. There was concern that the show would be canceled, but it was sold out. It was packed, and he walked out on stage. And again, you remember how tough it was for anyone to be funny after 9-11. And yeah. all the talk show hosts went away. Letterman was the first one to come back, and he gave this beautiful – didn't do stand-up, just started with the desk, and he gave this beautiful – I think it was one of the most magical moments in television broadcasting I personally have ever experienced. It's got to be on YouTube. And he just spoke to – if your job is to be funny and talk about contemporary and topical things and this sort of thing happens and the whole country is in mourning, none of us want to be funny. And he just spoke beautifully and articulately, which I will stop trying to recreate. It was like that that – Lenny even did this show two weeks after the Kennedy assassination, which was as – I'm going to say it <clears> – <throat> as devastating to this country if not more. We were just not used to our presidents being assassinated no. in modern history. And people didn't know what it meant. They didn't know what it meant. Uh, two weeks after that, Lenny Bruce bounds on stage to a sold-out crowd at Carnegie Hall and his opening line is – Von Meter is fucked. <laughs> so maybe that was the night that the term, the question too soon yeah. was invented. Um, and it just sort of spoke to what he was about. So back from the digression, Steve Martin says, let's stay away from that stuff because – It's still too soon. <laughs> it's not always it's still too soon. But um, – the, the, the show is going to be real lively, right? Real lively, real up, real positive. So – and I, he said, I remember early Lenny Bruce recordings and appearances on talk shows before he found his edge that were like uh, when Pryor was on uh, 
Carson, maybe the Ed Sullivan Show, or Carlin came out in a suit and tie. These guys were squeaky clean and they were hilarious, right? So we found – he helped me find the one hilarious bit and, uh, you know, I memorized and worked on it. And then we had a rehearsal and Steve Martin was really protective of me during rehearsal. He said, I'll, he said why don't I – come out and tell the audience, James and I decided to do a tribute to Lenny Bruce because he had an important comedy album was recorded at a midnight show here and it was historical. And I called a friend of mine who I've worked with in movies. You all know him as an actor, but you may not know he's a great comedian and impressionist. Please welcome Kevin Pollack. And then you come out, Kevin, and then we'll stand there together and we'll, we'll do a little business together. And he said, why don't you do a couple of other voices while we're having this business so they can see you do voices and then I'll say, all right, Kevin, take from here and I'll walk off and let's have a lighting change so that when I walk off, it's now Kevin's time and he becomes – I mean he orchestrated all that, which was magical and incredible. Yeah. The bad news <clears throat> for Vince early, CSEP, is there is no recording of it. There's no recording of it? What Did they forget to push record? Was it no. one of those situations? It was not to be recorded. <laughs> it was a live show. And it was not for broadcast in any way, shape, or form. It and was, nobody had their cell phones out because <laughs> they were pasties. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, there are photographs that I got from the house photographer that are pretty magical. And I, I, as you can hear, I have a pretty vivid memory of the experience. But no help to uh, Vince Early. Other than to answer his question, there is no recording that exists. So um, does that mean he must have been there to see it? Uh, how did he no, know about it, this? It, it's in my book. I talk about it in my book, uh, uh, How I Slept My Way to the Middle. Not just a funny title and technically still available. <laughs> but I've definitely talked about it on the show previous. So thank you, Vince Early, for the question. Um, Before this, we move on from that, first, I, I'm, sure. I crushed the entire season of The Marvelous Miss Maisel in like 24 hours. And one of my favorite what happened? pieces. I loved did it. you just stop your life? I mean, no, I just I sat in bed from Netflix. All, I mean, there's not there's not as many episodes. I don't know why you guys had so few episodes for a season. I could have watched There, there were only two. It's true. No. There were only two episodes. <laughs> no, but, there's there's eight, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm used to crushing a lot more episodes than that. Sure, sure. Uh, I was a big fan. They, like, I wanted to see it because it's related to stand-up comedy. And yeah. I like the, the whole timeline of it. But what really caught me was when Lenny Bruce came in. Yes. And I was like, holy sh... This is, this is like historic stuff that's also implanted in an incredible... Incredible show. How much of the character of Lenny Bruce in that show is really um, an honest portrayal of him? Well, um, I'm not that old, thank you. Well, <laughs> um, but I will say that that Amy Sherman Palladino, who she and Dan write the episodes, and you know, there's a writing staff. But I, but I, I sense that much like Larry David, they they kind of have a very heavy imprint on every episode, even when it's assigned to other writers. Um, my point being, her father was a Catskills and Borscht Belt comic when she was a child. So she knows that world growing up really, really well. And um, I can't wait to have her on the show to get a little clearer answer on were there any actual conversations that she used that were taken from, from life? Because my general understanding is it's all fiction. And the central character is a mixture of a couple of different acts that were mm -hmm. around at the time, which are, are women who had to come up in this world, right? Um, but the guy, Luke Kirby, is the actor's name who portrays Lenny. And I spoke to him uh, after the first table read just about, you know, the difficult nature and, and good luck of, <laughs> of, of portraying someone so steeped in – in the vernacular. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of video of Lenny. When I went searching to do the bit, right, mm -hmm. for the Carnegie Hall thing, I, I there's so little video of him other than deep in his career when he's in a trench coat on stage reading the transcripts from the trial um, of being arrested yet again. But early stuff, in fact, it was Steve Allen's Tonight Show. Uh, that was the appearance that I I uh, found the bit. Um, so 
talking to Luke Kirby, the actor who portrays Lenny Bruce in Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, um, he, 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 I think he's phenomenal, especially when you get towards the latter episodes. And it's that great time also of Lenny's career where you can sense – and I say this as a fan of the show, truly, not, not as a participant at all. Um, I, if I wasn't in this show, I would be – I would never stop talking about it because mm -hmm. this is exactly the kind of – Mad Men, uh, favorite show of all time. I love Mad Men, but there's something so much more relatable to me as a comedian. Sure, of course. The, when I watch The Marvelous Miss Maisel, it's, it, it's, it changes everything from reading books about what I've heard happened to right. feeling like these characters are emotionally allowing me to experience it. And that's in a cheesy way, but absolutely no, what I not, loved about it. That's you not know? cheesy at all. Yeah. Uh, there, there is a sense of uh, historical accuracy and also um, – the way life was, right? Uh, each one of these characters has a very rich uh, thing happening. And so the, when I was saying about Lenny and the arc of his career, we're getting him when he's a New York sensation but not mm -hmm. yet a, a, a – Nationwide sensation. Yeah, a household name, um, which is a great time. And also I love that the Lenny Bruce character is, is a supportive character. It's never about him in any episode, which I think is so important. Uh, to the central character's uh, story, uh, that he is supportive of her. Um, and Rachel Brosnahan, who won the Critics' Choice Award as well as the Golden Globe, is so deserving and so exceptional and, and is the heart and spirit and so on and so forth. But um, uh, yeah, I love that you uh, binged the show. And yeah, it just happened so, like, so quick. Like I knew I wanted to see it, but I was expecting, I don't know, is eight? Episodes enough of a season? We're like, doing that's not ten. Fair. We're doing Thank ten goodness. in season two. <laughs> <laughs> it gets me really mad. I'm like these lazy actors. Just give us a couple more episodes. It's interesting that you blame the actors. Well, for I mean, de deciding <laughs> yeah, the number of whoever, episodes. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the the creators of the show had written twenty two, and the actors said, "No, no, we'll only do eight. <laughs> yeah, that's what I figure. Um, by the way, as an actor who gets paid to do a television show, I wouldn't mind more episodes <laughs> myself. Uh, but it is the the world of the uh, the Amazon Prime and and some of these other um, offshoots. I, I I binge a lot of shows. I just started watching Mr. Mercedes. Do you know this one? I have heard it only by name. It That's was all a I know Stephen King novel mm -hmm. in, in, at first, I guess. Um, and then David E. Kelly is writing the, I think, eight or ten episodes that I'm watching oh, wow. right now. And that's already out? Or? Yeah, yeah. It's on the audience I've never heard of the audience. Is this Network. a new? Is this a new streaming service? This is the. Buy? This is the beautiful thing. It's on Directv. I think it's only on Directv. Okay, but it's but it's free on Directv or included in your package. It's free when you pay for Directv. <laughs> yeah, great, great. I don't pay for Directv, so it's going to be rough to get that in. Yeah, I'm sure there's some other way to find it, um, but I'm uh, enjoying it tremendously. Um, let's read one more letter and then let's get to you. How's that sound? It sounds great. Um, going through several now. Oh, we have a thing on the show called the Larry King game. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. I mean, I I've tried, you know, finding somebody else competing in the Larry King game because I'm a competitive person. Mm -hmm. I have only heard you talk about the Larry King game, but worst impression of him. Right? So you've not heard an example of one. I, I, I tried, but like well, when you try to shuffle through episodes and try to find specifically that, you don't do it every time. Am I crazy? Almost every time at the end of the show. Mm. And these t tend to be long. So t today, in fact, you'll be asked to do your own. I was afraid you were going to say well, that. Well, don't be afraid. Okay. You're an improviser. <laughs> yeah, but so, Larry da uh, not but, Larry but, David, Larry King. But, but the key ingredient, a bad Larry King impression. So you can't lose. I mean, I designed it so that you can't lose. Um, you could talk in falsetto and still be correct because I want a bad Larry King. Okay. And then it's Larry when right before he goes to the phones, he shares something about himself, his thoughts, his opinions, mm -hmm. a story that comes to mind. He stares down the barrel of the camera and he would choose to share something, you know, his first ride on a pterodactyl, <laughs> whatever it was. He's old. Um, and then he would go to the phone and, and the name of the city is funny sounding. Those are the three ingredients. Okay. Bad Larry King, 
He shares something about himself, not about you. you oh, okay. yeah, absolutely. We did have a couple of guests who didn't get that part, and they shared something about themselves. Like incredibly private and <laughs> yes. awkward? Oh, yes. Oh, jeez. Yes, it was fantastic. See, I'm glad I got that in because I was yeah. gonna, it was going to be my – never mind. Uh, so – I did find one that I will read if, if the, the um, audience out there has a good one and I read it. I send them a T-shirt, a Kevin Pollock's chat show T-shirt, um, which I can also get you. Oh, that would be great. As a guest on the I was going to say, I, I'm going to have to do it and I <laughs> don't get a T-shirt. <laughs> I'll give you a T-shirt. It may uh, not be a chat show T-shirt. Well, that one's worn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't even have your logo on it. Nope. Just a brown T-shirt. Um, this is from Brendan McKee. I would like to clear up all of the confusion and so, see. I'm doing a not so bad one. That's really good. <laughs> see, no, you, I mean, you're not really good. I not, mean, that's. I thought. I thought that it was. It kind a, of sounds like him, oh, which is not the. That's not the rule. <laughs> I just don't know how. This is my version of a bad Larry King it's impression. Great. By the way, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Uh, I would like to clear up. Uh, yeah. I would like to. There's a little Brian Del Mary in there. Yeah. I would like to clear up all of the confusion and settle the debate once and for all because I was present uh, for the discovery of both the color orange and the fruit orange. And of course, the color came first. On a related note, I have tried to make it with an orange. I have tried to make it with an orange before. It was easier after I peeled it. But I have never tried to make love to the color orange. Unless you count the foursome I had with Trump and Lake Tahoe a couple of years ago with a couple of porn stars. I did make Whoopi, though, and most of the, with most of the cast of the color purple. Let's go to Keith in Lake Titicaca. Um, so, topical. Got a little Trump in there. Porn stars. I see what you're doing. Uh, Brendan McKee, uh, write to us again at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com if you have a Larry King. And also, Brendan, uh, you were not kind enough to include your address, so uh, I'm going to need your address to send you a physical uh, mailing shipment. Um, James Heaney, mm -hmm. my guest today. Oh, James. Oh, Kevin. If I may call you that. Please do call me that. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's my name. <laughs> well, it makes the most sense. <laughs> it really does. Um, let's start by something we were talking about briefly before we went on the uh, microphone. Mm -hmm. I mentioned something about uh, wanting to get donuts, and I, I, I've uh, driven a Tesla now for, uh, geez, six years maybe. Uh, um, so you're an uh, early adapter? Uh, Is that what they call it? Truly early, and I, I'm on my second one now, and I think I'm two years. March is two years. Yeah. Uh, on the second one. Um, uh, but uh, I drive by Costco and flip them the bird when people are lined up for the cheap Costco gas. Oh, yeah? Even them. I Do you feel good about that? <laughs> you know those people don't want to buy gas. Like every one of them is sitting there flipping the bird at their, their cars wishing they had a Tesla. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I also put on a Mr. Burns mask. Oh, that's from good. The Simpsons. <laughs> um, no, but uh, I was driving, so I didn't want to Google. But you, there's a big uh, live Google Maps uh, in the, the center console on this like 17 inch crazy iPad screen with pinchy mechanism, like on a phone or an iPad. And um, so I could just type in the word donuts, mm -hmm. and then 17 through the navigation, <clears throat> 17 choices popped up telling you how far away, and you tap one of them, and it, it shows you the directions. So I, but I went through them trying to find the right name. Right? Yeah. And as I was telling you the story, you mentioned, you asked me if I had ever – Driven a test loop. Tesla loop. I think it's pronounced Tesla loop. And, and so – So here's – the reason elaborate. I said that is I thought that you were just going to tap the button on your Tesla and it was going to drive you to the donut shop that you chose. Uh, which – Apparently I, is coming. And that's what my wife says and I trust what she tells me. She brings me news stories and I believe them. Uh, Where did she tell you that she, she is right now? Uh, she was – she went to yoga. OK. And she was going to try to be home by the time I got home from here. OK. So uh, if she comes home from quote unquote yoga – I mean I, I don't know why you'd say quote unquote. A little perspiry. Oh, there's – I mean, yoga's a workout. She's always flushed and glowing when she's done with <laughs> yoga. 
<laughs> and her spirits are up a little. Yeah, she's always really happy after yoga. Okay, great. Uh, I don't know. She she says it's, I guess, must be women's only or something. I'm not allowed to go. Sure. Uh, I get it. <laughs> I get it. So uh, the Tesla loop. The Tesla loop. So there's a, a Tesla car. It's, I, I, it, you know, it's a Tesla. Sure. And there's a guy in the seat of the driver's seat, uh-huh. but he doesn't even need to be there because it's a self-driven car. And I took it from Palm Springs to Los Angeles. And how'd you hear about it? Well, I was at the theater, Westside Comedy Theater, doing a show, and I had um, gotten a callback. And my bottom line is my wife's family was meeting us in Palm Springs for this, like, planned event of, like, hanging out. Uh And I had a callback Monday morning super early. I wanted to just take two super cars to Palm Springs because it's not that far of a drive. But my wife really wanted the company on the drive there. Sure. And so it was a big deal. And somebody was like, hey, why don't you just take a test loop back? And it's just a Tesla that's self-driven and will drop you off at locations in L.A. So that's how I heard about it. Specifically designed between Palm Springs and Los Angeles? Well, at the time, it was Palm Springs and Los Angeles. I think they had San Diego. Now they've expanded and you can get it from like Santa Barbara. There's a few different places. I think maybe they're working on Vegas, uh, but I'm not sure. Was there a charge involved? Oh yeah, it was eighty. It was like eighty dollars. Okay, but you, it was a cuff, comfortable seat, and uh, you're in the back seat. I, you, there's that's what it felt like a station wagon or an SUV because I was in the middle seats, and I brought. You had your choices, and you went with the middle seat. Well, I'll tell you what, my choices were limited by the time because I got it last minute, and my last minute choice was middle seat. Um, oh, so there's other people in the car. Oh, yeah, there's other people. Oh, it's so not like it's just a carpool. A, it's a carpool. Okay. And one guy is sitting in the driver's seat, and he's the driver, but he makes it pretty clear that he doesn't even need to be there. Yes, he made that very and clear. And there were several times where I was like, you don't have to have your hands on the wheel, but could you at least face forward? Uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, because my car has autopilot, mm-hmm. uh, and it has two functions. One, which is similar to cruise control where you lock it into a certain speed, right? Mm-hmm. But the cruise control on the Tesla is connected visually to the car in front of you. So when it slows down, my car slows down. That makes sense. And when it speeds up, I speed up. And, and I if, haven't touched anything. Yeah, what if a car like jettisons off of, uh, you know, a curb? It will like keep, it'll, it'll keep It'll going. connect to the next car. To the next car. So also, you're not going to – like that's a dumb question. You're no, not no, it's follow not. somebody off the road. It's not a bad question because it's the first thing you think of <laughs> as an owner. You're like, what, yeah. what, what, what? And then the other – the second version of cruise control is side to side. So if you tap both of them, it will keep you in between lanes. And on the screen in front of you, the dashboard, it will show you in real time cars going by you on either side, motorcycles, everything. Mm-hmm. Car in front of you, car behind you. Um, when but, you say real time, you mean it's a camera, right? Well – I, I mean that it's sort of animated on the screen in front oh. of you instead okay. of an actual visual camera capturing real life. So these animated versions of cars and motorcycles are are moving in real time. And then um, the, the, there's a little, little pop-up at the bottom, hands on the wheel. Mm. Every now and then that will pop up as sort of a reminder. <laughs> and if you don't move the wheel a little bit to let the car know you've got her, then it will shut off. The autopilot. Doesn't that sound dangerous? Like if your hands aren't on the wheel, don't you think they should keep it going until they're somewhere safe? Well, so I like the reminder, put your hands on the wheel. I mm-hmm. like the car insisting that I stay active and involved. So I've always been a little nervous, as I think most people are, especially as, as a few Teslas are crashing. Not many, though. No, no, not many, especially compared to a combustion yeah. engine. I mean, I can go off on the rails yeah, forever sorry. on this. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm, you become overly defensive. One of the things about owning the car, it turns you into a, a salesperson. <laughs> I've sold 30 of these fucking things. Um, but the idea that, as you said, I'd like the driver to at least face forward. Yeah. The, it's coming next phase, of course. There's no driver, mm-hmm. right? And then we'll see how, how long it takes people in their trepidation to, to jump on board, right? So you've got a a car full of car po- – are you talking to each other? Like, well, wow, this is Well, I don't weird. know. At first, we – like, there was a little bit of conversations. Everybody, and probably including myself, I, I had been drinking because, I mean, you know, I'm not driving. Oh, this is a Sunday night. This is Sunday night at, okay. like, I don't know, maybe 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night. So You're hammered night, like every Sunday I'm night. throwing up. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. I, I need to go to the bathroom, so I'm tapping the drive. No, uh, I ent- ended up – what I did is I sat in the car for a few minutes to see, like, what is it like in this r- this room? 
this moving room. And it didn't seem like a conversation I wanted to be part of. So I put on my VR headset and just When you say VR, you mean? Virtual reality. Okay. So <laughs> you didn't want to just tune everyone out with your ears. No. You, had, you wanted to turn them out, tune them out with your eyes as well. Yeah. And I don't know what they thought of it because once I put my headphones down in the VR, they could have been talking about me the whole time. You really did that. This oh, is absolutely. Not a bet. Are you joking? No. Nope. Yeah. I mean, I, I go, I'm on the road a lot, so I got to keep myself constantly entertained, whether it's through VR or. Do you remember what you were watching on that particular I trip? do. I was watching, um, God, I said I do. And now I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to say it was Stranger Things. Oh. It's come, it's it's a Netflix show. Maybe it was Defenders. It was I don't know something on Netflix. So when you say I, I'm un, I'm unfamiliar clearly with virtual reality, you're able to watch television through a headset that goes over your eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like a so I it's mean, not a video game anymore. It's, well, it's, it could be, but what I was doing in there, if I was playing video games in a in a test loop, you'd be I'd, hitting people. I'd be hitting people. Right. I'd That's be no good. Screaming at the people that are beating me in a game. I'm so naive. I didn't realize you could just watch TV. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So but, so you were watching TV. I was watching TV wearing my... goggles and headphones. <laughs> yes. Okay. Cool. You were every. Everyone's favorite passenger. <laughs> I mean, if I'm I'm sure. the, if I was the worst problem in that test loop, something's wrong. Like I wasn't bothering anybody. So, so, <laughs> so the, your first time in a test loop, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. Your first time, you were so enthralled by the experience, you put on goggles and headphones. Mm -hmm. You were so impressed by the state of the art robotics and the future of artificial intelligence, you put on headphones and goggles. I mean, it was at night, uh, like maybe five minutes after this thing started driving all the magic tricks had been done. five minutes yeah it doesn't into a two-hour drive it's like three three hours <laughs> it's like palm springs right if you're going 50 i mean this was not a speeding car it was it was a driverless car with a man in front of the reading window. a book apparently yeah uh but you wouldn't have known this because you had goggles and headphones yeah and but once in a while even with like even with my headphones and my goggles on i could hear the car hitting the rumble strips on the side of the road. Interesting. Uh, which I don't think that we were in danger. And I totally like if you're out there needing a ride, go for test loop. I'm not against it. But yeah, they were hitting the rumble strips. Did it cause you enough consternation to remove the goggles momentarily? I mean, yeah. What, what the problem was is my hands were sweating at this point in time. Because? <laughs> I was a little nervous when these – I'm like, I'm a nervous person. When you start hitting rumble strips in No the wonder car, you had goggles and headphones on. <laughs> yeah. That way you couldn't see anything. And plus, like, I don't know. I breathe heavily <laughs> and uh, my goggles, sometimes they steam up. So I had taken them off a couple times. But you can't see anything out of the windows in the dark. It's dark outside. Your goggles encase your nose? Uh, no, but like, I guess my mustache must get some air up into the goggle area because it gets steamy. Like, all right, I'm trying to picture the whole thing. You were adding to the production design mm -hmm. to Stranger Things with your own steam. Yeah, probably. Well, it's it's actually the production design's not good because it's just fog. And like if you start rubbing your fingers inside your VR headset, yeah. uh, your the lenses scuff easily. I see. And then you need like something serious to wipe them. I see. Okay. Um, so <laughs> you're maybe the last person I should ask what was the experience like? Because you can only report about five minutes. Well, no, And then I mean, also hitting speed bumps. Hitting speed bumps. <laughs> and the, the problem was is I was in the middle of the, the thing. I wish I would have chosen – I wish I would have gotten a window seat or like, like I didn't want to be in the middle of this van. No. Whatever it was. I don't know if a Tesla Loop van. It felt like a station wagon, but it, maybe it was an SUV. They have an SUV. That must be what it was. Yeah. I didn't want to be at the spot I was at. I would have rather been in the front or in the back. Sure. But I felt like uh, I couldn't talk to the people behind me, couldn't talk to the person in front of me. I just wanted to kind of there were There were even a row of people behind There was a you. row. It was a full car, and so I was in the middle. There's a passenger seat? There's like three pa – there's – up front. Up front. Up front passenger seat is yes. one person. One person. Three of you in your row. I think there – if you're in, in the my middle, memory, it was two. It was two people in the mid row. It might have been three. I don't know. No, in your row. In I was your in the row. middle row. <laughs> okay. In. So there, if there are only two of you, mm -hmm. why would you have to be in the middle <laughs> seat? <laughs> I mean the middle of the front and the back row. Okay. But, and but you still the, have a window. Well, there was a gap. There was a – I couldn't lean on the window or I'd have to be leaning off my seat, Kevin. I well, I don't know the design of the uh, SUV. I mean, don't quote me on it either because I don't remember it very Okay, but well. then there's a row of seats behind you. Mm -hmm. And there's two, sure. two or three people I in that row. I believe there was three people behind me. Okay, so now there's six passengers in this vehicle. Yeah, well, one's a driverless driver. 
That would be the seventh that, that, person. That is not complaining, but letting it know that it's kind of a waste of his time to even be there because he doesn't need to be there. The thing could drive itself. He was mentioning this. He mentioned it, that he didn't even need to be there. Hi, folks. Welcome. Yeah, my name yeah. is Jeff. I don't really need to be here. Yeah, but legally, because uh, you're yeah. not allowed to have a driverless car without a driver, he had to sit there. Sure. And then complain. He yeah. was getting paid. What's his problem? Oh, yeah, he was getting paid, I'm sure. I don't uh, care for any of this. Yeah. All right, James, let's learn a little something about you now, okay. shall we? You sure. were born and raised in— Well, I was born in the suburbs of Chicago. That's right. Uh, I grew up in Crystal Lake, but what? I had moved from Chicago. Like, uh, like as I was getting older, I lived in Des Plaines. I lived in Cary. I lived in Crystal Lake. They, my parents just got further and further from the city as I got older. And trying to find names of towns that no one's ever heard of. Oh, everybody's heard of Cary, Crystal Lake. Really? You, nope. You never heard of Crystal Lake? Crystal Lake, Illinois? Yeah. No. It's where the campground was? <laughs> Which camp? Camp Crystal Lake. Oh, I see. There was a Crystal Lake near uh, where I grew up in Northern California. Was there really? Yes. Oh, wow. I haven't been there. Never heard of it. I don't think uh, – and those are the only two Crystal Lakes in the United States. I'm going to say there are many. No. Yeah. Well, maybe. Sammy, Isn't can you where, Google? Where can you Jason Voorhees killed? Yes, Jason Voorhees. Oh, that Crystal Lake. That Crystal Lake. I mean – uh, I don't know for sure, but I always imagined it. It was the Crystal Lake I was from. I'm not as familiar <laughs> with the those movies, so I didn't know that was the name of the lake. That yeah, that that Jason got a little busy. Mm -hmm. Very busy. Uh huh. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you, Schaumburg is out that direction. I've been to Schaumburg. There's a great improv. I've performed there many times in Schaumburg. Yeah, so that's I'd say that's about halfway between Crystal Lake and Chicago. Okay. Um, and what was life like? I picture. Idyllic. It was a pretty good life. I mean, I got I was pretty lucky growing up in the suburbs. It was uh, siblings. Complain. I have a sister, mm -hmm. uh, and I have a little brother. I have a little brother that is. You eight. said that kind of like a surprise well, after the fact. For most of my life, I've had just a sister. I see. Uh, I have an eight-year-old brother also. Now, now I see. Now I have an eight-year-old brother because one of your parents remarried. Uh, didn't remarry, but had another kid. <laughs> you know, it's just the wonderful. You're, you're how old? I'm 37. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And so 29 years after having you, mm -hmm. they decide to give it another go. I, I mean, sometimes it's decisions. Sometimes it's miracles. Your sister's older or younger? My sister's older than me, two years So old. I am right. It's 29 years later. Yeah. And um, most last childs, myself included, we have a little bit of us that thinks we were a mistake. Mm. I mean, I'm only two years from my older brother, so that's, that's less math. Uh, 29 years – uh, do you talk much – did you ever talk much to your folks about, uh, hey, what's the deal with the child 29 years later? Uh, I mean generally so. It was it was more of a, one of those situations like it's a little brother and it's a wonderful of addition course. to a family. But I'd like to get one of them on the phone right now. I mean it would be tough to get him on the phone. I, as soon as I walk into any recordings, I power down my phone okay. and delete all my contacts. <laughs> okay. I didn't understand that part. Uh, no. Because I have a question for them. I mean, you could. I mean, I guess I could try to call them on the phone. It would be. It would be weird. It would be uncomfortable for everyone. <laughs> I'm sweating again. <laughs> Jeez, I feel like my VR headset steaming up. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, growing up there mm -hmm. near Crystal Lake or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, did you have a curfew? Is it that kind of life growing up? Uh, not really. My parents were pretty easygoing. I guess if I was home after 10 o'clock, I would probably be in trouble. But I don't think a, if in my memory that we had strict curfews. But I was a pretty well-behaved kid. So 9, 10 years old, if you're – you know, you're, I'm going to go out and play whatever thing in the streets, there was never a, all right, be back by – uh, I think it – I don't I, – I remember probably be back by 10. I or think it was just one of those things like I just knew better than to not They break. could count on you. They could count on because me. Because every night you came back early enough in tears and they knew yeah. he, doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't like it out there. <laughs> no, I wanted to come in as soon as possible. Yeah, mommy, please let me back <laughs> please. in. Please. Like banging on the door. No, I was an extremely well-behaved kid until I was probably about 16 and then, then I just got into oh, – nothing into trouble. Like legally, there's no record – uh, but I certainly— That's where you're wrong. Oh, shoot. <clears throat> what happened at 16? 
You just, you know, I just started to experiment, uh, started smoking pot, stuff sure. like that. You know, nothing bad. Uh, and I still didn't get in trouble. And I would argue that people thought I was a very well-behaved kid because I wasn't, you know, I was always nice, polite. Getting good grades. Good, well, I mean, my grades got better when I started smoking pot, which was very strange. Uh, but it was also when I started doing improv, doing theater, there became a reason for me to do good in school. Gotcha. Because before that, I didn't care. I just didn't care. And then when there's these other things, uh, like in context of like, oh, well, if you don't do good in school, well, then you can't do these other things. Then I did good in school. You had some incentive. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, sparks the first idea to do improv? I was in what was similar to like a breakfast club scenario where they thought I was at risk of dropping out of school, being a bad bla- – like just like generally uh, – Who's they in this scenario? The school. Sure. The school. The school. <laughs> we, the school. The entire school got together. The entire school. Reached out to your parents and said, we think we've got a breakfast club situation yeah, on our hands. And well, your parents said, I've not seen the film. Yeah. Um, it, it hadn't even come out yet. <laughs> I wasn't getting into a lot of fights, but I wasn't getting good grades. I wasn't like – You're I smoking just, pot. No, no. That was no, before. Not yet. Not okay. yet. I, okay. was, I was a very well-behaved kid that was just not doing well in school, not doing homework, you know, doing nothing. Um, so for such a well-behaved child, what do you attribute the lack of homework doing? I just – I guess I was just bored with school. Like I, I just, was too. I was so bored. The teachers were bored. That was yeah. my problem. The teachers were bored. But that was all like elementary school. So once high school got around, they were like, you know – Sorry, you were born in elementary school? No, I wasn't born in all I – was, I was bored in all – yes, I was bored in elementary school. That's what I asked, yeah. Because uh, they would give a homework. Like why give kids homework in sixth grade, fifth grade? It, in my real life, if somebody wants me to do work at home, I better be getting a salary. I better be getting paid for my hours at home. And you felt that way as a fifth grader? Uh, I don't know if I was able to articulate it, but I decided that I wasn't going to do work at home because I already did my work at work. That's school. Uh huh. You know, so when when homework is assigned, mm-hmm. and you clearly see that other students are doing homework because they're bringing in their work. Well, they, I'm not seeing them because I'm not playing while they're working <laughs> at their house. And you're like sort of dummies. laughing at them. Uh, no, I would never laugh because I was too polite. I sure, was I like, understand. Just get a hold not of me. polite enough to follow instructions and do your homework. No but way. Certainly polite enough not to laugh at kids who were doing their. I homework. wasn't going to try to like hold their cramp their style. No, Go I understand. Ahead, do their do their homework. Uh huh. And why do I feel like your story of losing your virginity might be uh, worth sharing? Um, I don't know if it's worth sharing. It was, what age? I uh, – let's see. Uh, I don't know if I want to tell the story. OK. <laughs> uh, but it's – I would say it was a, it was a healthy age. It, okay. And it was somebody my own age. So it's like those are good things. Also good? Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're both under 17. And oh, we were stag- both under 17. Then it's statutory. Right? Oh. Well, I was now, hoping me, that we didn't uh, have to say that. Yeah. Well, listen. <laughs> uh, I once grabbed a 13-year-old girl's boob. But you were 12? I was 13. 13. Yeah. That's, that's – uh, Playing in my own field. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, okay. So rather than talk about losing your virginity, okay. which I can respect okay. that you'd rather not, let's talk about your first fight. Physical, first physical fight. Fisticuffs. Wow. I, did, I used to get into a lot of fights. I, did I not, was pretty good at it. I did not know that. Yeah. So very well behaved, again, flies in the face of some of these other attributes like no homework and lots of fights. Mm-hmm. Well, th- I guess that was one of the reasons I thought I was at risk of dropping out of school. I was very nice, but I was also kind of nerdy and I got a little bit picked on, but I wasn't the type of person that was going to let that slide. So you fought back. When I it, fought back. And what? I was – lucky for me, I was I was big. I was bigger than – like I got kind of got my growth spurt early, so I was taller than most people. And did someone teach you to fight back, or is that an instinct that kicked in? It was an instinct that kicked in. I definitely, my my family was not one that thought fighting was like a good thing. Definitely don't get walked all over, but I was never like taken out and shown karate. In fact, <laughs> they're like, you're like, this is the way you're going to fight back. Yeah, I just love that moment in a film or fiction somewhere where a father or uncle or neighbor takes it upon themselves when they see a kid being picked on to pull them aside and just teach them how to throw a punch. Not, not wax on, wax off. Just put the left hand up and guard your face and then your right hand does this. Yeah, I was never taught that. I wasn't either. I just loved that movie. Yeah, picture. I mean, that's a great that's a great piece. Uh, yeah. to, but for me, it was just like I found out that it really didn't hurt that much to get punched in the face. Uh, so it was not like it was not that big of a deal. But then as I got older, I really like I adamantly am – 
uh, against violence. I don't think that it should be used in any circumstance. In any circumstance? Uh, I, I mean, I feel like this is going to get crazy, but I feel like if you're using violence to solve something, then you're becoming more of an animal. Uh, and I don't blame it. Like if I was to be attacked by somebody, there's a pretty good chance I would physically try to defend myself and then hurt that person. But – I don't think that that's the right thing to do. I think that's the animalistic thing to do. Yes. I think that if you can ever use uh, anything, any other – Like just saying quit it. Like quit it. Stop. Stop. Stop hitting me. Stop. Here, take my money. Uh, those kinds of things are way better. Yeah. If someone says give me your wallet mm -hmm. and you've got for some unknown reason $7,000 in your mm. wallet – <laughs> did I say pick, that, no, did say I, that, did say I pick the right time. number? God, yeah. Say that one more time. Okay. Seven thousand. Seven thousand cash. Inexplicably, it's in your wallet. Okay. Or wherever you keep cash, maybe your front pocket. And someone with a knife or gun uh, says, "Give me your money." In a situation where you can't run. Mm. I was that was my I was going to run in a zigzag pattern backwards. <laughs> I mean, that was my go-to. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you're the first person I've heard use add the word backwards. Well, so you you're have looking to. at them. Well, otherwise you won't know where they're pointing. And as long as I'm zigzagging, running backwards, how fast can you run backwards? I mean, with these headphones, I'm not very fast. <laughs> I'm talking about with your virtual goggles on I mean, and your headphones. It depends on if it's augmented reality or not. If I have some sort of live feed and not animated <laughs> stuff like a Tesla, but like a live feed camera, I can run quick backwards. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Um, uh, so give me your money. You're running zigzag. Well, I would, if somebody really wanted this scenario, my money. Uh, he's got you cornered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't mean to be sexist, folks, but in this case, the mugger is a man. Oh, no. And he's I got was, uh, part of my I, I thought it was going to be a woman. I was going to charm her out of just take her to dinner or something. What's your name? Is that what you were going to ask Yeah, her? what's your name? Uh, talk, <laughs> talk to me. What's going on right now? How about we split this $7,000? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, gosh, I didn't know you had that much on you. Yeah, and I said, I didn't either. This is new for me. <laughs> yeah. I'm fine with 3500 in my pocket. You can have the other 3500 Okay. Well, we found a peaceful solution, a resolution. Um, uh, I've actually had somebody uh, when I was – I think I was – might have been 20 years old. I was in Chicago at Cohen College at the time and I, was, I didn't have a lot of money but I got – somebody pulled, like you know walked up to me and said, I have a gun. Give me your money. And I said, I need some of this money. I swear this story is true. I, Let's uh, back it up just a couple okay. of beats if we can. I need more information leading up to it. Okay. Where, where are you when this happens? Specifically, I'm on diversity. Uh, if you're familiar with Chicago, you're diversity a, and Clark. You're on a busy I'm, street? Well, it's late at night and it's on a sidewalk. So it's deserted. There's no people around. Uh, yeah. There's no people around. There are homes or businesses. It's big buildings. It's Chicago. Diversity – it's like diversity and Clark Street. OK. Stop saying street names. They mean okay. nothing to me. I'm very okay. sorry. I'm ignorant. Um, so give me a general sense. It's businesses, Wrigleyville. High, high rises. Wrigleyville. Like don't know what that means. You don't we're like uh, okay uh, just business a, big businesses big buildings. That's what I want. I help, big help, buildings help businesses paint the Chicago perfect. So but there's no people on the sidewalk. Well, there's uh, not many. Not there's many. this guy that's in other come words up to when me. the guy comes up to you and does he come from behind? He comes from in front. He's on a bicycle, which um, is the weird thing. Is bicycle, he pulls bike. up on this bicycle and like kind of like power slides like so he's sideways. I'm with my friend and we both You're with a friend. Oh yeah, I'm with a friend. And he says, I've got a gun. Give me your money. To both of you. To both of us. My friend does gives him all of his money. Does he show the gun? He doesn't show the gun. He put, does he put his hand in a pocket? <laughs> yes, he does. Does that old trick? Does he put his fingers forward through I, the pockets? I mean, if it was fingers, then he fooled me good because it looked like a gun shape in his pocket. Okay. And I wasn't really prepared to ask him to show it to me. I did want to ask. Mm -hmm. Uh, my friend just gave him his money. Your friend reaches into his pockets mm -hmm. and hands over it's like ten dollars. You know, your friend's loaded. Yeah, I mean th that's about how much I had too. But and so your response was mine was I, I and this is honest. Like I had to be able to get to school the next day because I would be in trouble. If I was late to this, I had a voiceover class at Columbia College. And this $10 and was, meant you might not. Well, I said that I could give him some of the money I had. It was definitely not a $10 bill because I said I needed to save X amount so that I could take the train in the morning to get to my class. And how did he take that? He he was okay with it. He was. I couldn't believe you it. You reasoned with it. I couldn't it. believe it, which every time I've told this story, people are like, well, that's because he didn't have a gun. 
And that's an easy way to say that I didn't really, you know, have a good bartering system here. First of all, um, of course he didn't have a gun. I mean, why, why would you who, say that? People who rob people don't kill people. <laughs> that's a statistical fact. Yeah. Uh, according would you according be- to television. <laughs> that's pretty good statistics. All of television. No, I don't know shit from Shinola. So the guy puts his hand in his pocket, looks like a gun, says, I've got a gun. Mm-hmm. You know, never so be- far. Never believe that. You, I've got you really a gun. You really don't believe that? Show the gun. Okay. Be- that's why I was asking if there are a lot of people around. No, there, there was of- not a lot of people around. Right. Good time to show but- a gun. Because if you want money fast, show the gun. I think. Yeah, I probably – if he showed the gun, gun, I might not have bartered with him. He might have got the extra $2. I mean nobody wants to get shot. You, no. you, you, you at a certain point realize it doesn't hurt that much to get punched in the face. Yeah. But you've not yet learned what it feels like to be shot. Never been shot. OK. Never been Same shot. Same here. Happy to say it. Yeah. I've uh, been cut. Mm. I have been cut. I have not been cut. By myself. I yeah. cut well, my, my Well, I mean I've done that. OK. <laughs> um, and it hurts bad. Sure, real bad. So so, I've got a gun. Your your friend pops out ten bucks. You say I need how much for the train tomorrow? Whatever it was at the time, it was oh, probably like two bucks. Okay, I need. I, I listen, need to take the red line. I can there. give you my money, but I need to hold on to two dollars yes. so I get the train tomorrow. And you're giving him all the truth. Yeah, and he says, "Okay, fine." Yeah, he's he's pissed, but he's like, "Fine, fuck, man. All right, yeah. fine. Give me give me what you got." And then he let us leave. Yeah, let us leave. He, he didn't bike off into the he night. Didn't di- uh, I. Think I think he did actually bike off into the night. Now that you say that, it's That's funny exactly that you bring it up. That's exactly what happened. I've seen yeah. the police report. Yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. Is there a police report? No. No Of course way. there isn't. No, no You way. guys just went about your business. At that time in my life, I would – and I still wouldn't. I would never call the cops on something like that. I don't I don't want to bring cops into a situation. This is a, a, a inside deal here. I don't want to call the cops. Why? Why? What are you hiding? Well, at 20 years old, ugh, I mean I would – You said it even now. What? Just now, you said even now I would not call the cops. <laughs> well, I mean, I, if I was to tell you what I'm hiding, I would. The cops would be. I'm sure that there's some cops listening right now. We have a 17 percent audience. I had a feeling in the law enforcement, or or serving overseas. Well, actually, here in California, I don't think I'm breaking any laws. But back then, when I was going to college, I probably was rolling down the street with some illegal things. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, I wish it would be more general. So. Um, so so there we have it. You were uh, you were you were mugged, mm-hmm. and it went well. Yeah, it went great. I have that's I I also one time when I was I think it must have been eighteen. However old you can drink in Canada, it was just before I turned that old because I was buying a ticket to Canada to go to Toronto, not to even drink because I wasn't a drinker. Um, Why were you going to Toronto? My friend lived up there. I guess he was going to I think at that Cypress School or something. I don't remember, but we were visiting a friend that moved up to Canada to go to college. From Chicago. From Chicago. And so I was going to Union Station to buy my ticket to Canada. So I had at the time quite a bit of money for me in my pocket and I had just bought the ticket luckily but I still had extra money. And this guy came up to me and this was brilliant. I mean if I ever wanted to start mugging people, this would be the way to do it. Hmm. And he had a $20 bill. And he held it out. He's like, can you break a 20? I said, yeah. Yeah, I can break a 20. I pulled out my wallet. He grabbed my wallet and he ran. Mm-hmm. And I didn't run after him. He was bigger than me anyway. So, you know. He but, walked up with a $20 bill between yes, his fingers. Between his fingers. Showing it to you. Showing it to do me. You have, do you have change for this? Do you have change for a 20? And you being a good person, happy to help yeah, anyone in need. I was like 17 or 18. Do I 20. have change for a 20? And I felt like this is yeah. my opportunity to make a difference. You help know, somebody out. Help somebody out. Reminds me of one of my favorite jokes. Uh, father and son walking down the sidewalk. Kids about five. Mm-hmm. They come upon two dogs going at it, having sex. Oh, jeez. Sure. Dogs do this. So the five-year-old son says to the father, hey, dad, why do you suppose they're doing that? And the father says, huh? Oh, uh, huh. Okay. Yeah. You see the one in the back? He heard his front paws. Uh, and the one on the front is helping him to the hospital. <laughs> and the five-year-old says, oh, wow. Just like life, huh, Dad? You help somebody out and they fuck you in the ass. <laughs> yeah, that's just like life. Yeah. You help somebody out and they fuck you in the ass. Uh, speaking of um, – so uh, did you ever do any time in the local Who Scout? No. No. Uh, I've never – I've only been pulled over by the cops one time. What happened? Um – I was like 
underage, probably 17, with my girlfriend at the time, and I was going probably 85 miles an hour in like a 50. Because you were? Because uh, I had to get her home because she did have a curfew. Mm. I was dating a girl that had a curfew. So the cop pulls you over, and he says? And he's like, license and registration. And you say? I said, I don't have it. Oh, I don't have any of that interesting. stuff. But, but I'm close to my house, and if we can just roll up to my house. I can get you all that information. And he said, I've heard this before. Get out of the car. And he, well, he was a little upset. Then I offered him literally a Butterfinger bar. No, you didn't. I did. What's the matter with you? I don't know. And uh, I, like, <laughs> it was Sam, all I had. Sam rarely laughs at anything uh, in the many shows I've done here. He never laughs, in fact. You just put him back in his chair with his hand on his heart. <laughs> well, I had just gotten back from the movie theater and I had like snuck in. I don't have a license or registration, but what I do have, officer, is a Butterfinger. I did. I had a Butterfinger bar and I offered it to him and he like w – it, he looked like he was about to really get angry. <laughs> but what he did – what he, <laughs> he didn't laugh like Sam? No, huh. not at all. And I was scared. It was probably partly because I was shaking. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I'd never – Spent time in so jail. So you said – again, walk us through it. I don't have either of those things, Yeah, I looked sir. through the and, glove and, compartment. And, and why wasn't your license in a wallet in your pocket? I was irresponsible. OK. I, I just Let's don't – Let's leave I it at that. Yeah. And there's no registration in the car because – It was – you know, my – I never put it in there. <laughs> you, let's just, go back to I am irresponsible. I'm irresponsible. So, so you say to the officer, I don't have either of those. Mm -hmm. He looks pissed, but does he say anything? Well, he says – he says, I just pulled you over to make sure you were being careful for deer. There's a lot of deer that come out in this area. Oh. And he let me go. And what? that was that. With or without the Butterfinger? With He didn't. He specifically did not take the Butterfinger bar. Oh, no. I just pulled uh, you over to let you know there are a lot of deer, deer in the area. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what's called the suburbs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's white privilege, suburbs. honestly, is what it is. And I and I do think – like that's – when you ask how it was growing up in the suburbs, I feel like I'm really lucky because uh, the way that I have been irresponsible in my life with any other life, I wouldn't be here today. No. No, you wouldn't, and that's why I've called you in today. Um, <laughs> oh, no, that sounds <laughs> ominous. So who are your comedy influences once you start to get into improvisation? Um, who well, are you seeing? Do you go to Chicago? Do oh, you yeah. see some shows? Oh, I mean, I was constantly going down to, like, Second City. I used well, to— now you're bragging. I mean— yeah, a little bit. I, I mean, I was lucky. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. That Again. was a train right away. Sure. Uh, and how old are you when you start attending live improv shows in the big city of Chicago from tiny, tiny, tiny Clear Lake? I'm 90 percent sure I was 16 years old. That's correct. I have it. Uh, in the that's good. I know that when I, I first took my first Second City class, I was too young. Mm -hmm. And the reason they let me take the class was because there was I was in a team of people that were of age. Well, you're on your way via the train to Chicago when a gentleman asked you if you had change for a 20? No, that was on my way to the Union Station once I was already in Oh, Chicago. going to Canada. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So uh, we never heard what happened on that. In oh, terms he took of, my money. He took your wallet. He took my wallet. And then you did not go to Canada? Oh, no, I ended up going to Canada. Without a wallet. With I ha It was so actually when you got pretty the, bad because I had to go get a new – I had to get a new license. When I you think got I, to the border – they said, just wanted to make sure you're, you know there's a lot of deer in the area. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, this was pre-9-11, so the border situation I'm sure is much different now. But we were also – I was taking a train. I was on an Amtrak train. To if I may, um, I'm pretty sure Americans have always needed some sort of identity to go from one country to another. Yeah, but not a passport. Like I said, some form, some you're right, form totally of identity. Right. Did you show him a Macy's card? No, no. I had to get a new license made because when I was going down there, I was purchasing my ticket for Union Station to go to Canada. I wasn't getting the ticket and that getting That wasn't the travel to, day. No, no, no. That was not the travel day. That was the day that I went to purchase a ticket. You got mugged that day. That day. So in a way, lucky. Yeah. It wasn't a travel day. I, I shouted thank you to the guy as he ran. I was like, thank you. <laughs> I got time to get a license Which again. I'm guessing he'd only heard <laughs> twice before. Yeah, I'm In sure. his many, many days of mugging. <laughs> yeah. Only twice before had he heard his uh, assailant. Is the assailant the victim? I don't know. That's good. One that's of us <laughs> should know that. Assailant. Uh, I feel I like the assailant the... might be the uh, aggressor. Yeah. Have you ever been assailed? I've not been assailed. Knock wood. Um, no, I've had a lot of scary situations, never a mugging or an assailant. Mm. Um, I find myself in trouble all the time. Throughout your own personal history? Yeah. Uh, yeah. With the law? 
No, just with, with muggers. Muggers. <laughs> so you shared. You shared two. Uh, you shared two experiences. Yeah. Are there more? I mean, I do. You want to hear more? I mean, how many more are there? There's at least at least two more. <laughs> I can think of one without even effort. Okay. Uh, and so it wasn't really a traditional mugging. I was on a bus. I uh, only recently, after living here for like 11, 12 years, got a car. Uh, Happy for you. I, I took the bus And everywhere. the family. Thank you. Sure. Um, and on this bus, I was on my way home. It was probably like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Absolutely. And this guy was tagging. Are you familiar with tagging? I'm he not only tagging familiar, the bus but this reminds me that I, in research, watched a video of you doing stand-up from the West Side <laughs> this Comedy is probably Theater from there, yeah. in 2012. Yeah. Okay. This is probably that story. That that set I don't think went as well. It's not It's not really that funny of I a story. I felt you were on stage telling a story and you didn't care if there were any laugh moments. Oh, no. You I, needed to share this story. Yeah. This That's, was pretty recent, I think, at that time. Or no, it couldn't have been that recent because this happened in like 2009. Okay. You, you still had the freshness, though, on stage when you were telling yeah. this story. Uh, but I, this guy was tagging a bus seat, and I said, hey, what do you think you're doing? And he looked at me. He's like, what business is it of yours what I'm doing? And there's kids on this bus, which is the reason I'm saying this. Is like there's little kids looking at this guy tagging a bus, and no one's saying anything to him. And tagging, for the people out there who don't know what that means— uh, he's putting on like what I would say probably maybe – and I'm not that familiar – maybe gang language. Uh, but how is he doing it? He's using whiteout. He's Wh using whiteout on it and he's uh, putting mm. it on the seats mm. and he's putting like – it's as if it's spray paint but instead of spray paint, it's whiteout. And he's putting on his initials or his signature. So he's using an applicator yeah. from a bottle of whiteout. Yes. It's mm. not a felt pen, not no. a magic pen. No. White – White out. He, the only white felt tip he could find was using white out. Uh, yes. And he was with the applicator uh, putting gang signs or something on the seats. Yeah, some sort of signature. It's not art. I mean I, I'm a big fan of graffiti art. I live in Venice and I, I go and look at it. It's fun. We could this have is carpooled not here. We could have. Damn Do it. you really live in Venice? Mar Vista. Ah, yeah. I, then we could have carpooled. Let's there. let's both say our addresses at the same time. <laughs> okay. Ready? One, two, three. Two, two, seven. <laughs> oh, you didn't say anything. <laughs> well, I'm so, not giving the street name. <laughs> so uh, he's tagging with this applicator, which it seems like the daintiest way to tag. And you say, hey, what do you think you're doing? And he says, how do you think that's your business? And, and, and I like, said, what business is it of yours? What business it is of mine? And that's when he's like, oh, fuck this. Like, we're going to fucking fight. And he like, he like gets up and he wants to fight. He's like, listen. How old is he? He's probably maybe like 23. And you're? I'm probably about like 27. At okay. The time. Similar. 28. Something, similar age. He's a big fellow? No, he's about my size. He okay. was, I was definitely not afraid of him. I was like, I, but at the same time, I am a pacifist. I don't believe that violence is a, the answer for this. It was believe, his answer though. It was his answer. And he stood up. And he stood up. And, and he came at you. And he came at me and he's like, let's get off the bus and fight. And I said, you know, I don't want to fight you. I have no reason to fight you. But I was on the bus with somebody else who was like, we're getting off at such and such stop. Let's get off and let's fight. And I'm like, dude, this is not what I want to do. This is not my personality. I'm not somebody that wants to fight. I just don't want him to tag the bus while I'm sitting on the bus with these kids. You're with a comedian friend? No, I used to work at Activision. Yes, so I you was with certainly a, did. I, I was uh, at You're Activision. with a fellow employee. I was with a fellow employee that was who's, also a game tester. Who's uh, of certain size? That he was a little bit older than me and a little bit bigger than me. And he was from New York. He liked to fight. He loved to fight. Okay. He was into it. He was so like, he said, let's, let's get off at so-and-so and, stop. Let's exactly. do this. And I was like, this is not a good idea. So immediately this guy starts dialing other people and being like, we're getting off at Main Street and Ocean Park. And I'm like, oh, gee. He's, I don't want to get into a fight. And now he's calling people. Backup. He's calling for backup. He's calling for backup. He's calling for backup. Does your just... friend call for backup? No, my friend doesn't have backup. So it's going to be two against however many however the tagger many, can gather. However many the tagger can gather. And you get off the bus. So when I'm getting off the bus, uh, I'm I'm getting off at my bus stop. I'm not going to just ride the bus to nowhere. I'm like, I'm like, okay, I wanted to stay on the bus, but there's this side of me that like, well, this is my stop. And it was before the aforementioned gathering spot, your no, stop. No. No, this is my stop. That's it's the stop. My friend didn't. Your lie stop to him. is the stop. Is the stop. Okay. My friend told him, okay. and that my friend, and then this tagger was telling people meet us at that stop. Okay. How many people it was? I don't know. It's probably only two other people, but still, I didn't want to get into a fight with one person. Sure. 
Now there are at least three, at least including three the Tagger. And then I've also got a friend who's— Against you in New York. In New, me in New York. Right. And so you get off the bus. And when I'm on my way off the bus and I say, you know, this gentleman here, I'm telling the bus driver, I'm like, this gentleman here is getting off at this stop to fight me. And as I'm saying that, he takes a box cutter out of his, and he's got a box cutter and he's walking towards me. And I'm like, I don't want to get off this bus with this guy with a box cutter. No, you don't. And no, but I, but I stepped off the bus and the guy didn't use the box cutter. Luckily, I think it was partly because of the fact there were no boxes. There was no boxes. Uh, Well, I, I got off the bus. The guy punched me right in the face. With the box cutter. He put his box cutter away because I called him out on it when he was getting off the bus. The bus driver saw him. Hey, but, hey, no fair. I call blockies on the box cutter. Yeah. You said. Exactly. I said that and box so he cutter put it away be. and then punched you in the face. He did punch me in the face. I did not respond with another punch. That was the end of that. But – my friend got into a fist fight with the other people that had showed up and like was not happy. This is, this story does not make me look good, which is why I priv- probably I, should. I don't know that that's true. Uh, Pick, look, not make you look good because of your pacifist uh, Yeah, ways? well, because well, first of all, New York wanted to get into this fight, and he was pretty good at fighting. The problem was is there was like two people that he was fist fighting, and I had gotten punched, and like did and like once I didn't do anything after that, they left me alone. I your, didn't get punched in the nose. The it was tagger like, hit you in the face. The tagger hit me you right in the face. You did not respond, and I the did tagger not respond. stopped. The tagger stopped. Did he then drift towards his other two no, friends to didn't. take on New York? That guy He didn't. just stood next to you, so, and, then and that the two guy, of you watched New York take on two guys. And he got hit. He was bleeding. His face was bleeding pretty good. New York was. Yes. Okay, so he was getting— And then they stopped because the cops. The, the bus driver called the cops. And they were starting to arrive? They were starting to arrive. You heard sirens. No. They, the truth was that the bus driver said that the cops were on the way, so those guys left. Cops are we, coming. Exactly. Exactly. So then it broke up the fight. The assailants yes. left. The assailants left. And then you in New York did what? Well, then we ended up going home, taking a second bus there, and that guy was kind of pissed at me for not fighting with him. Wait, wait, but wait. But I was very clear. Taking a second bus home, that was your stop. Well, yeah. I took the bus from Ocean Park to Main Street, and then I took the number one bus on Main Street. You were planning on connecting anyway. A connecting bus. <laughs> a quick fight and a connecting bus stop. <laughs> Uh, but my friend was like a little upset that I didn't join into the that fuck's fight. your problem, man? Why didn't exactly. you fight? And, and you said, said, I said, I was never wanting to get in a fight. I made it very clear on the bus I didn't want to fight anybody. Like that's not going to answer anything. That's not going to solve any. That's problems. not what. A, that's not what a James Heaney's about. No, I don't. I mean, if you, if if I was to fight, I would believe it's because. I have lost control, and that's I'm right. no longer a human being that's controlling myself. I'm the animal human. Right. Know? Right. I'm sensing a little uh, inner concern Mm -hmm. that um, the animal got out once. I mean, yeah. And it scared you. Oh, yeah. You didn't care for that animal. No. You'd like to restrain that animal. Absolutely. Forevermore. Forevermore. Right. I mean, I've I've, – you know, flown off the handle. I've flown off the handle. I've never hurt anybody seriously, mm. but I've gotten people to the point where the thing is, if I'm going to look like I'm going to do something violent, I'm going to make it big. Because I can do big characters. So I'm going to look like I'm crazy. Sure. And that usually is kind of disarming. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would think so. I would think so. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, there were so many other things I wanted to talk to you about. I'm sorry. But I know. <laughs> my fighting history Please is— Please <laughs> don't apologize. I forced these stories out of you. You can't apologize for that. I will not allow it. Um, at what point, I do have this question, in your travels, creatively, artistically, when is that moment, that first time, that I believe we all have, or I'd like to believe, where a part of you or— an actual voice says in your head, holy shit, I'm officially in show business now. Um, I guess what it, it, it was when I started doing – I was in a company called Gamefront and I was playing video games on YouTube. It's not the exact kind of art that I wanted to do. But we were getting you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of views of people watching me play video games mm-hmm. and pretty badly. And I was getting tons and tons of fan mail. I, get, I was getting – I have pictures at home. People have painted me of me playing video games. And that was where I was like, wow, it's going to be hard to top this job. Uh, is it the traditional showcase uh, like showbiz? It's not. It's not really like I, – I don't feel like I've hit my, what I really want to do yet. But I feel like I've accomplished some things that I never dreamed I could. Right. As a kid who was taking the train. Yeah. I mean to I was told – I was definitely – when I was in school, I had teachers being like, video games – 
are never going to do anything for you. You've got to stop memorizing Mortal Kombat fatalities and start doing your homework. Well, if I may. Yeah. They weren't 100 percent incorrect. <laughs> no, probably not. But they were partially incorrect because, as you say, you went on to fame on YouTube. I mean I made my living for five years playing video games and just acting generally like an asshole. <laughs> if like I may, that was my go that was my thing. If I may though, <laughs> also taking the bus? Yes, I was taking the bus. Okay. Yeah. Out of pride? Uh, I just – yeah. I mean I was broke. I'm still – I like the – I'm still broke. I don't have like lots of – I don't have Teslas. No, no. no. <laughs> First of all, it's not a competition. Yes, it is. <laughs> Second of all, uh, you, you you had fame and you said you were making a living for five years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, in no at no point during those five years, a part of you said, eh, maybe uh, – <laughs> no, I hate no. driving. <laughs> I, I really hate driving. Well, then that's why the test yeah. loop also makes That works sense. good for me. Yeah. Um, are you ready to play Kevin's oh, – first of all, uh, before we get to Kevin's pop quiz, uh, we'll play Ask Kevin. So you're allowed to ask me one question only uh, with possibly a follow-up but on the same topic. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what question? Jeez, this is really – this is tough. I, does it I, normally take this long? It do, does it normally take this long? Usually – Well, here's the thing is I feel like I want to get something really good. <laughs> OK. And that I appreciate because I was sensing it, it's on a need-to-care basis. A need-to-care? What, what does that even like, mean? Like no interest in – and cu- no curiosity to play guys, Kevin. <laughs> There's just no question that comes to mind because, man, I just – I don't uh, – I don't find anything about you curious. Uh, no, I mean there's uh, – here's, here's a question I have for you. Even uh, what's with the hat? No, I mean you know, that's, that would that's be... I mean the hat it, it's self-explanatory. You look good in that hat. I mean, I get it. Uh, what is your relationship mm-hmm. with uh, Christopher Walken? Uh, do you do does he find you entertaining when you do impressions of him? Um he does. Uh so my relationship is I I I, I tend to do impressions of – impersonations of people who I either admire or find ridiculous mm-hmm. or both. Um, and Walken early – like the only person who had done an impression of him on television that I'd seen was um, Jay Moore on SNL. He did a sketch, a Psychic Friends Hotline where it was just him as Walken on a couch with a table in front of him and a phone. And he says something to the effect of, welcome to Psychic Network Hotline. Call me now. The number is on his screen. Call me. I know you're going to call, so call. And then I don't remember what else happens in the sketch, but that's kind of it. Mm-hmm. But it but it was a revelation. Oh, my God, someone's impersonating Christopher Water. Cut to um, – I'm in the audition process with the guy, Christopher Christopher McQuarrie, who won the Academy Award for Best Screenplay for The Usual Suspects. He was 26 years old. We created a television drama pilot. We were in the casting process as producers. People were coming in and in between auditions when the casting person went out to get the next person, Chris McQuarrie and I started doing – uh, at the time, Kathy Lee and Regis Feldman were in the morning show. Mm-hmm. And so we did Christopher Walken and Bob Hope <laughs> sitting in for them. And he did uh, – Chris McQuarrie did Christopher Walken and I did Bob Hope. And I would say, hey, Chris, tell us who our next guest is, will you? <sighs> and then he would say, our next guest, Bob, you may not know, but – and then he would you know, improvise and we would make each other laugh. So this was on the Warner Brothers lot. We're in a golf cart. We're going to lunch. We see Jay Moore. We corner him. We cut him off with our golf cart, jump out and basically mug him and say, how do you do, Christopher Walken? Please teach us. We're, we're trying to teach each other. And Jay Moore said, "It's a two. every single syllable word, you turn into a two-syllable word when doing Walken. So the word no becomes now. That began the relationship. Then I started doing it. Then I was asked to be one of the two speakers when Christopher Walken got his hands and feet and signature in the cement in front of the Chinese Theater on Hollywood mm-hmm. Boulevard. Huge honor, way bigger than the star in the Walk of Fame because they're running out of real estate with the cement imprints. 
And I was asked to be one of the two speakers. I'd never met him at that point. You, I, no, I didn't realize that. I would have mentioned either you guys were close friends. Well, of course. Why or, would you call me? I mean, it became very clear to me. The other speaker was Quentin Tarantino, who they'd, who they'd worked together. So uh, when I got the call, I, I humorous, you know, self-deprecating said, you know, how far down the list did you have to go <laughs> before you call the monkey who impersonates him? I mean, I feel I felt bad for Chris Walken. That this is the best you can come up with? <laughs> Quentin Tarantino and some monkey who impersonates me? I mean, it didn't even make sense. But I'd done it on Conan O'Brien. I'd done it publicly, right? So I'm there, and that's when I found out that he loved it and he thought, you know, he was honored or whatever the hell. Um, Highest form of flattery, blah, blah, blah. And since then, Jamie, my better half, and I, we went, and, and also the head writer of the chat show, um, I just reintroduced her to the show as if anyone who listens to the show <laughs> doesn't know who she is. Oy. Uh, we saw him in a uh, uh, McDonough play on Broadway, The Behanding in Spokane. McDonough, of course, the guy who did uh, Three Billboards, mm. the Academy Award nominated movie which is one of the things I wanted to get to because we're here Saturday, the day before the Academy Awards, yeah. um, pre-recording this. Thank you, Sam, for coming in on a Saturday. We're just about done, I promise. Uh, so then, the, uh, anyways, that's how I found out that he was a fan of it. And we went backstage and spent a little time in his dressing room at the play afterwards. And yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the extent of the relationship. I don't I, that's have not his at all information. What I, expected. I thought it was going to be I, – I didn't know if he would have been offended by your impersonation. And I I think he's talented. I mean he's funny. But I don't picture him as a person that would laugh that easy at that at first. So I thought maybe it would have been – He's got a, a wild sense of humor. I thought it would have been a darker story of like how you got to know him and like doing the impersonations. But hey, I guess not. cut it out. I don't appreciate what you're doing. You're making fun of me. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of like I was wondering if that would have been where it started. No, he has a, a very, very strong sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. He's not at all what you expect. He's not what he portrays. He prefers cooking. There's a video of him on YouTube cooking, I believe, chicken and pears in his own kitchen. If you want to get to know who he mm -hmm. is, I would highly recommend that. Just type in Walken Chicken and Pears. Um all right, let's get to uh, uh, Kevin's pop quiz between 5 and 15 points possible for each of these three questions. And once the final score is tabulated, it will be posted on our website along with the current standing among the top mm. 100. You're sweating already. Yeah, I'm competitive, but I – Good. I okay. Question number one, Dave Keckner or Rob Riggle? Rob Riggle. <laughs> was that not the full question? Is, is there a sentence after that? No, but it was as dismissive as you could be of Dave Keckner. I'm sorry. Just for the record. I didn't mean to. No, no, to I want too. a quick answer. Hold on. Let me just. Uh, Dave uh, Keckner or Rob Riggle? Uh, Rob Riggle. Thank you. Carl Weathers or the weather in Carlsbad? Ooh. Uh, weather in Carlsbad. Correct. Last question. Keith? Johnstone. Okay. Uh, you know what? Uh, the score is not important. Let's talk about the Academy Awards. Wait a second. I mean, I must have at least been in top of like uh, top 100 is what, what I need to get to be on the board. Yeah. Was yeah. that close? The top 100 are people who got all three correct. Was it some of it? Oh, was it all got? Wait, top 100 that got all three correct? It was, top 100 it consists of people who actually got all three. That's how many people who got all three. How many did they get right? Well, you don't really. Do you want to know? I mean, yeah, of course I want to know. You got two out of three. Which one? Was it it, it was was well, it Rob Riggle? First of all. The last question is Keith Johnstone. No. Did I was that <laughs> You're so you're surprised that the, that Johnstone was not in That's fact. not the answer? Well, you know what? It's not a competition. I mean, it was. I'm not going to be on the board. I got 67% on that Tomorrow's test. the Academy Awards. I forget which one. Jimmy Kimmel hosting again. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought he did a phenomenal job other than when he went out to the street and brought people in. That kind of went a little sideways and lasted too long. I hope he doesn't do that again. But it's a near impossible job, and I thought he did exceptionally well for the record. Um, do you have uh, any uh, choices that people you'd like to see win? Um, oh. Do you care at all about the Academy Awards? Where will you watch the Academy Awards? I'm probably not going to watch the Academy Awards. It's like a boycott. It, no, 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 no. Not a boycott. Lack I just, of interest. Uh, my wife is probably going to watch them in the other room. I'll ask her to turn the volume up, and then I'll play video games in the other room trying to hear it. 
that's just how it is. Okay. I mean, I love video games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what I do for the Oscars. It's like everything. Yes, all the, the awards. Where were you, what did you do during the Super Bowl? Uh, I watched. I played video games in the room, and my wife watched. And whenever there was a commercial, uh, your she, wife watched the Super Bowl as well. Yeah. Did sure. she have a rooting interest? No. No. We just want to see the commercials. Well, I, she wanted to see. You were playing video games. Yeah, well, I, if I if I was in a commercial, I wanted to see it. Were you in fact in a commercial that played th- during the Super so. Bowl? No. Not okay. This time. Where are some of the commercials people can look for you uh, and, that are playing right now? Well, right now I get a lot of people telling me that they've, they're at the movie The Black Panther and beforehand a Twitter commercial comes up. It's with me, Romesh, and Lonzo Ball. No big deal. Uh-huh. Uh, but that's probably the coolest commercial I've been in. Not bad considering uh, Black Panther has made a billion dollars already. Yeah. And most people have seen that commercial. Yeah. I uh, guess – I think you – I haven't seen it yet and I want to. Uh, they won't let you? <laughs> they won't let me. Well, I <laughs> – <laughs> I want to see it, but I have right. a problem. You call in. They say, we'd rather you don't. No. Can I, you give, just give me a code now, James? We're not comfortable doing that. I got that. a movie pass. Why don't you not? go see Black Panther? <laughs> How about that, James? Why don't you just go see the movie? Well, I want to see all of the Marvel Universe movies you do. leading up to that. Yeah. Oh, p- leading up to it. So yeah. you got some homework to do. Yeah. I, okay. I The last one I saw was Avengers. Okay. And I haven't seen the, the, the Avengers Age of Ultron. I haven't seen Civil War. And I'm a comic book kind of nerd. Clearly. Uh, but I don't watch the movies, and I'm not going to go in and watch Black Panther until I at least see the Civil War movie because that's where he debuts. Okay. I feel like I'd just be a scrub going in and seeing a movie without seeing the, the first film he was in. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's okay. Thank you. I think it's going to be all right. Uh, I don't want to thank you. Uh, for not answering the Oscars question oh. more succinctly. Oh, do you want me to tell you? I just want Get Out to win. You want Get Out to win? Yeah. Was like, that your favorite movie of the year? I mean, it or really was. Or you just was. really loved it? Uh, it, was, it was my favorite movie of the year. Because there are no video games in it that I remember. No, no, there's not. That movie was incredible. I think that might be one of my favorite movies ever, uh-huh. honestly. It was That's scary. Great. I don't, like, I'm super brave. Not a lot of things scare me. Spiders, nope. Snakes, nope. A little bit. Not even muggers, as no, we've learned. No, I, I'm pretty fearless. Just, uh, just I get nervous about running out of gas. Taggers with box cutters. Not. I mean, I was nervous enough to tell the bus driver that this doesn't look like it's going to be good out there, uh, but not scared. Uh, get out. Like, I was scared. That movie, like, it had me jumping a few times, mm-hmm. and I laughed. I mean, I just can't think of many better movies than that. Right. Yeah. And Jordan Peele, just a, a, an astonishing accomplishment as a mm-hmm. first-time director. Um, I believe the statistic, as it was reported to me, only three times in history as a first-time writer-director to get nominated for screenplay, director, and best picture. It's only happened three times in history. Um, only one person has won all three, James L. Brooks. Do you know, mm. Can you guess the movie? Uh, I, it, it, and it was his first, first thing that time, he directed? First time as a writer-director. Gosh, his, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Call of Duty 1. No, was it? I he, just did assumed, he write Call of Duty 1? I just assumed. Well, I'll tell you what, they just a, called it Call of Duty. Uh, okay, that's I, mean, right. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Jaws 1, uh, Rocky 1. There's always a 1. No, no there's never a 1? Interesting. No. All right, well, if you say so. Um, I guess Kill Bill Volume 1. Hello. Yeah. Um, that's only because in editing he decided this is two movies. Is that true? It is true. Uh, or, a as the story that I, movie. that I read. Um, okay, so Get Out is really your, your choice and your option. Yeah, I, I didn't get to see as many as I would have liked. I really – it's not even up for anything, but I thought Stephen King's movie It was in, in, incredible. I'm a big fan of Stephen King. I've read a lot of his books and I thought that that movie was one of the few times I'm like, this movie's as good in, – in different ways but holds up to the book. The, the rare. Yeah. I thought rare. Rob Reiner did it twice, Stand By Me and Misery. Uh, yeah, know. both of those movies are incredible. Right. That's all I've got time for today. I want to thank my guest, James Heaney. You can find him on Twitter at... Uh, the Heen. The Heen, H-E-A-N. Um, where else can they find you? Uh, on YouTube, YouTube. At The Real James Heaney. The Real James... I do James. a, when I'm not too busy, news show called Brief News Brief. Right. I watched a couple of those, and uh, I found them very entertaining. Thank you. And uh, you seemed under tremendous amount of stress. I I mean, that's just kind of my personality. That's the character, I believe? No, that's me. Okay. That's me. Okay. I'm not as familiar with that one. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You seem like a very jovial, fearless sort of fellow. 
Oh, I'm fearless. Yeah. I, but I also like my. I'm just. I, I would say my, my anxious, a little anxious, but in, in an excited way. Oh, good. Yeah, positive ang- anxiety, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to dread. Yeah, definitely not dread. All right. Um, well, enjoy your video games tomorrow while uh, uh, over a billion people watch the Academy Awards. That's not true. Is it a billion people are going to watch that? Worldwide. Wow. Yeah. I just made it the number. It feels, <laughs> it feels right. Um, what, what video game do you think you'll play? I am probably going to be playing uh, – there's a game called uh, – I, I don't even know what the name of the Kingdom Come, I think is what it's called. That's correct. Yeah, it's it's a new game. It's like Skyrim, but it's uh, a new game. Are you excited about it? Yeah, it's really sure. cool. Um, well, thanks for making time for us today, James. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Are you ready for your Larry King game? Would you like the rules reiterated? <clears throat> yeah, give me the rules one more time. <laughs> Bad Larry King impression. Right before Larry goes to the phones, he decides to share something about himself. I want – that's the moment. That's what really the game is about. Okay. Larry sharing something about himself and then go to the phones. And if the name of the city is funny sounding, wherever it is, it's not going to hurt. That's it. Whenever okay. you're ready, take your time. No pressure, no hurry. No pressure, no hurry. All right. Uh, I – uh, I had this coffee, and the coffee, somebody put butter at the bottom of it, and, the, and the, uh, it was really, really good, and I wanted to save for this coffee, but after about 30 minutes when the coffee cooled off, the top of my coffee was completely splotched with uh, re-solidified butter, and when I tried to drink it, I had to chew on the coffee, and all the joy of the beginning of the cup of coffee was completely gone by the time I got to the end of the coffee, and now we go to Odessa, Texas... Where we're learning about boarding up windows. <laughs> that, ladies and Jews, is how you play the Larry King game. All right, James, I can't thank you enough while I wrap things up for the folks at home. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, as is tradition, apparently, uh, to put your name somewhere in this table. And um, here at the Fine Ear Wolf, I want to thank our engineer, Sam, again, for making time for us on a Saturday. God bless you and the family. Uh, said the atheist. Now... Uh, for the rest of you, write to us again, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. I will read more of your letters uh, next show um, and more of a uh, on-hand personal experience with you, the listener. Um, I want to thank uh, Corey Levin in post. And I guess that's it for today. Yeah, I believe that's it. All right. Until next time, and as always, get out of my face.